you, Gabriel, for the invitation, and thank you to the other organizers. And I'm going to talk about the work I did in the, in the past few years with uh, Carlo Ciliberto, Lorenzo Rosasco, and Francis Bach on structure prediction, with the goal to find uh, a unified algorithmic framework for structure prediction with strong uh, theoretical guarantees. So what is structure prediction? Nowadays, uh, learning problems are far more complex than just plain uh, regression and classification. Indeed, uh, uh, very often we, we need to learn uh, uh, images from images, text from images, uh, text from uh, audio signals, or even more complex stuff like uh, uh, 3D structure of proteins from uh, uh, the associated DNA. So, for, um, so in this kind of problems we have uh, 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 some peculiarities. In particular, both the input space and the output space are complex and structured rich spaces, way uh, more complex than vector spaces in general. Uh, in particular, what we can, uh, so, uh, we can consider structure uh, prediction when we have input and output spaces that, have, um, that can be defined in terms of parts. Okay, so for example, in images, we know that uh, we can represent the image in terms of a collection of small parts. In particular, for example, for, for images, uh, we have uh, patches, and we know that two patches, if they are very close, they are highly, highly correlated usually, for example, in natural images. And this correlation uh, decreases very fast if the patches are quite distant each other. But we know also that if two patches are very similar, maybe this correlation is implying uh, a semantic correlation between the parts of the images. So we would like to find an um, algorithmic and theoretical framework that is able to learn and leverage the um, implicit structure of the, of the image in order to have faster learning rates. Okay, so let's go on... Uh, on mathematics. So here we have x the input space, y the output space. Our output space is accessible via loss function that uh, measures the error of predicting y prime given y. And the data model is uh, represented by probability distribution over x times y. The goal is to recover the uh, target function that is the best possible function relating the input uh, with the output, uh, that is the function minimizing the um, uh, expected risk, uh, which is the average error the function perform on a new xy sampled from the distribution. This problem is uh, uh, more difficult than a variational problem since here we don't have access to the distribution row. The only way to access it is via a data set sample independently from the distribution. So in particular, the goal is to uh, provide an estimator, f hat, which converges in value to the, uh, estimate to the target function f star when the number of examples tend to infinity. So this property is called consistency. And in particular, we, wa we want to characterize uh, how fast our estimator converges to the target function. Uh, so we would like to have uh, uh, some rates uh, of convergence. Okay, so what happens uh, if y is a vector space? This is a well-studied problem. It uh, covers regression and classification. For regression, uh, y is uh, r. In classification, it is a subset of r. And uh, usually in this case, um, the standard approach is to uh, select uh, a subspace of the function between x and y, in particular a linear subspace of a, or a convex subset, and to perform the so-called empirical risk minimization, which consists in uh, solving a similar problem to the one defining the target function, where the expected risk is, uh, is substituted by the empirical risk. It is uh, the average error performed on the observed data, plus a suitable regularization. This general approach essentially covers all the algorithms we know in, uh, in supervised learning, from linear models to uh, kernel methods. And 
Mm, yes, usually if G is um, a vector space or uh, a convex set, this problem is quite easy. And L is convex uh, and R2, the problem is quite easy to optimize. And there are strong theoretical guarantees uh, in terms of consistency and learning rates. What happens instead when Y is an arbitrary space? So in this case, we have the problem of can we apply, so the question is, can we apply the standard techniques from empirical risk minimization in this case? And the answer is practically it's not even clear how to define uh, and to parameterize the space of function G. Imagine the simple case where the output space is, uh, uh, for example, a circumference. Two function, if you sum two functions, uh, which output is on the circumference, their output is not on the circumference. So, you don't know practically how to optimize this. So, in this case, uh, two approaches have been developed. Surrogate approach, um, so given a structure prediction problem, uh, a specific embedding in R2D is developed, and for that, a, a, a theory, a, a ad hoc theory and ad hoc algorithm is developed. So, you can achieve learning rates that are similar to empirical risk minimization, but you have to repeat the process from scratch for each uh, structure prediction problem. So if you have a new problem, you have to start again. On the other hand, you have uh, score learning techniques that provide a general algorithmic framework, but for which there is no mm, essential no theory and also for specific cases, it is even proved that it is not convergent, but it is quite, quite used in practice. So the goal of our work is, is it possible to find a unified algorithmic framework that works for many loss functions and many structure prediction problem for which we can provide theoretical guarantees in a unified way? And at the same time, as we see later, to uh, uh, leverage the local structure uh, that is in each input and output data. Okay, so I will introduce uh, uh, the learning algorithm. I will discuss a bit uh, um, computational and statistical properties, and then I will discuss about uh, how to extend this algorithm to take into account the local structure. So the final goal is to recover the function, the target function f star from x to y. This is the implicit characterization, the, the implicit definition as the minimizer over all the set of measurable function, but it is not really uh, insightful. Instead, we can characterize, we can give a pointwise characterization of f star. So if um, the output associated to the point x here is the one that minimizes the conditional expectation of the loss function given the point. This is quite interesting and uh, uh, quite intuitive because for each point x we find the, uh, the y prime that minimizes the loss. So this is what we could expect. And indeed it is quite easy to prove at least uh, um, in terms of the, of the construction of the function, then for the measurability we need uh, some additional tool. But this is useful when we combine it with uh, our assumption, the assumption of implicit embeddings. What do we require here? We require the loss function to be writable as an inner product. So we should require the existence of a Hilbert space H and two maps, phi and psi, from the output space y to h, such that the loss function can be written as an inner product. So uh, psi y prime phi y. It seems quite abstract, but actually it is uh, a mild assumption. Indeed, for example, if uh, y, the output space, is discrete, it always holds. Just to give uh, an intuition, uh, if y is discrete, for example, the set 1, 2, 3, 4, k, up to k, okay, uh, the loss function Lij is just a matrix. Okay? So h in this case is r to the k, psi and phi are 
the maps from the index to the associated uh, um, uh, canonical basis. In a similar way, it is possible to prove, uh, instead of using uh, matrices by using Fourier transforms, uh, it is possible to prove that uh, um, if Y is, uh, can be embedded in a compact subset of R to the D, then uh, any smooth loss on Y is, um, satisfies the implicit embedding assumption. And you can generalize also to uh, uh, compact manifolds or uh, subsets of compact manifolds. And also in other cases, just to say that the, this assumption, if your loss is non-pathological, holds on your loss, the one you are considering. What do we do with this assumption? Okay, so starting from the pointwise characterization of the target function, we are going to uh, use our characterization of the loss in terms of the inner product, and then we switch the uh, expectation with the inner product. What we obtain here is a characterization of the target function in terms of the conditional expectation of the feature vector y given x. Why it is interesting? Because now mu star, we have a, a characterization of f star, so the target function, in terms of mu star, that is a function from uh, x to h, so a vector valued function, while f star is a function from x to y, that is not clear how to parameterize. Uh, now the, the, uh, the construction of the um, uh, estimator is quite straightforward. Indeed, instead of using uh, uh, mu star, we propose an estimator that uses an estimator for mu star, that is mu hat. So f hat is characterized as the same structure as before, with mu hat instead of mu star. So how can we uh, compute mu hat now? Mu star is the conditional expectation of phi y given x. Since it is a conditional expectation, it is the uh, minimizer of uh, a, a, an expected square loss problem. So the idea here is to just use standard tools from empirical risk minimization. In particular, uh, we substitute the uh, um, expected square error with the empirical square error plus a regularizer, obtaining these squares, essentially, or kernel ridge regression, if you want to consider non-parametric models. So the solution now of mu hat, by solving the problem that we've seen before, is a, a linear combination of the observed feature vectors so phi y i, linear combination of phi y i, where the coefficients are computed depending on the uh, inputs. So if, we, the, if x, the input space, is a linear space, and we are considering just linear functions, the coefficients are computed in terms of the inner products of the observed data and the new data. In particular, here we have two objects, k and b. K is a, a gram matrix, dimension n times n. Each element is the inner product between xi and xj, that are my inputs. And v of x is a vector where, um, given the point where we want to do the prediction, the vector is computed by the inner product of this point and the observed points in the data set. If we, uh, instead of using a linear model, we use a non-parametric model, so we use kernel, for example, uh, mu hat has the same structure, but the, the only difference that is that we substitute the uh, inner product with the kernel evaluation. But the structure is still a linear combination of uh, feature vectors, phi y i. So for now, the algorithm is still abstract, since we need to know h, phi, and psi. Now we see that actually, to compute the algorithm in practice, we don't need them. Indeed, so this is our estimator. We have seen how to compute uh, mu hat. Now we are going to um, use the definition of mu hat to simplify the formula. 
we have seen it is a linear combination of feature vectors. Now um, the sum and the inner product can commute. And then here we have again the inner product between phi and psi. But now we know by definition that this is the loss function. So the, the final computation of the algorithm is a barycenter of the loss function on the observed outputs with the coefficients that we have computed. So to run this algorithm, we don't need the knowledge of h, psi, and phi that are instead useful for, to characterize the theoretical properties of the algorithm. So just to recap, I have a structure prediction problem for which I know the loss function. I choose a kernel over the input, possibly universal kernel. So the space of function is dense in the space of uh, uh, co continuous function between x and y. And uh, I derive this estimator. So given a new prediction, a new point x for which I want the prediction, the prediction is given by the barycenter of the uh, loss functions over the observed outputs, uh, where the um, weighted with coefficients that can be computed uh, uh, in close form in this way. Not here that the total cost. So you can think to two phases. In the first phase, uh, you pre-compute the kernel uh, matrix K, and it could be th uh, thought uh, as a um, training phase. In an inference phase, instead, given x, the point where I want to do the prediction, I compute the coefficients alpha, I, and then I solve this problem. OK. So since to run this algorithm, we need only the knowledge of the loss function can be applied essentially to uh, any structure prediction problem. In particular, if you want theoretical guarantees, uh, the loss function should satisfy uh, the implicit embedding assumption. But we have seen that it is a really mild assumption. So if your loss is non-pathological in a sense, uh, it satisfies such assumption. And there are some works where it is characterized in detail. Once we have it, we have just to optimize a problem over y. It seems difficult, but actually it's simpler than solving empirical risk minimization between x and y. Why is that? Because uh, imagine that x and y are discrete. Empirical risk minimization in that case would be an optimization problem over the space of function between x and y. So uh, a set with cardinality, cardinality of y to cardinality of x. Here instead, uh, for each point x, we need to solve an optimization problem over y. So this optimization problem uh, is, um, is a cardinality of, uh, so a cost of cardinality of y in the worst case, and we have to do it cardinality of x time. So this approach has a computational total cost of cardinality of x times cardinality of y, while an empirical risk minimization approach would have a cost of cardinality of y to cardinality of x. So even in the case of classification, we see the difference. So now we have an algorithm. It is applicable in general to uh, structure prediction problems. In particular, if the optimization over y given the loss is easy, it is also easy to compute. Of course, if uh, uh, the loss function and the problem uh, give rise to a NP-hard problem, I mean, it is, not, it is not possible to avoid this complexity. But the question is, uh, do we have generalization properties for this algorithm? Do we have consistency in learning rates? OK, we have this result that uh, relates uh, the excess error, so the difference between the error of our estimator and the uh, uh, error of the target function in terms of the L2 distance between the uh, estimator for mu star and mu star. It is interesting because here we can plug all the results we know from the uh, um, kernel ridge regression and non-parametric uh, uh, learning theory. 
In particular, if we choose a kernel that is universal, then we have that uh, mu star uh, is consistent, mu hat is consistent, from which, uh, by plugging the theorem before, we obtain the consistency of our algorithm, if lambda is chosen properly. Moreover, if the function mu star belongs to the set G we are considering, that is a standard assumption in uh, non-parametric learning, then our estimator has a learning rate of n minus one-fourth. So not here, it is quite different from what you see usually in uh, regression, for example, where you have n minus one-half. But since this result hold for uh, any structure prediction problem, and the difference is in, in, uh, in the cost of this constant. In particular, so also for binary classification, we know that for binary classification, under the same assumption, uh, this rate is optimal. So in a sense, either we uh, do a more refined analysis uh, that is different from each uh, structure prediction problem, or this rate is unimprovable. Okay. So we have seen an algorithm that can be applied to a wide class of uh, uh, structure prediction problem, and it is explicit, can be computed, does not require uh, nothing more than the knowledge of x, y, and the loss function. We have theoretical guarantees that are uh, as general as the one for empirical risk minimization. And in particular, it is possible to show that many surrogate results are subcases of this more general analysis. We don't see it here. Uh, so this, uh, this algorithm has been studied in a, a different ad, uh, other setting and it's been generalized, in particular in case where uh, y is a manifold, L is uh, the geodesic distance, y is a probability space, and L is the vastest time distance and generalize also to other settings where the goal is to uh, retrieve uh, ordering between uh, uh, objects in the input space. Then the analysis has been uh, uh, refined. So we have seen that the bound depends on a constant uh, chi psi, essentially a constant uh, that measures the interaction between psi and the output space y. And uh, uh, it has been shown that this, this constant does not blow up. So if my space is, uh, uh, for example, the space of uh, uh, permutations or the space of all possible labels I can have in a multi-label problem, um, the constant is polynomial in the number of labels. So it does not explode, uh, it's not exponential in the number of labels. And then th this uh, algorithm has been extended in other setting. In particular, here we have considered uh, uh, specific estimators for mu hat, the one deriving from uh, kernel ridge regression and non-parametric learning, but it is possible to use other estimators, for example, based on logistic regression or uh, softmax. And in particular, uh, um, this approach can be extended to take into account the localization properties of the data. That is what we are going to see now. So, we have seen that uh, usually, images or text, uh, but usually uh, ri um, rich and structured data, is a kind of inner structure. So they can be described in terms of a, collections, a collection of parts. And the parts have a relation between each other. In particular, we can define a, a, a concept of correlation if to, and a concept of distance. And you expect that if two patches are similar, are um, close, they are, they are also highly correlated, while if two uh, parts are quite distant, they, then they are uh, essentially independent. So to, the goal here is to, uh, in principle, to be able to learn uh, also by using one example. Imagine that I have an image with a lot of like infinite patches, I could take uh, <coughs> ImageNet and create just one, one big image of the input, and it is my image in the input, and one big image in the output. I mean, in principle, a learning algorithm should be able to understand this uh, and learning by just using this example. In what we have seen before, instead, we have that the learning rate depends on the number of examples. So 
I would, uh, I would like to see instead the rate depending on the number of examples and the number of parts. <laughs> so if the parts are uh, not too much correlated with each other, uh, I, could, I, I would like to be able to learn just by using one example and a lot of parts. So we need to formalize this assumption. We introduce two concepts, interlocality and intralocality. Interlocality essentially tells that, uh, so just one word on parts. Um, so here, from here on, parts are just an index over the input and the output. So in a sense it's a, a, um, let's say a, a theoretical object, okay, quite abstract. But we can think to specific uh, kind of parts in images, in audio, for example. For images, we can think to overlapping patches of a fixed size or maybe pyramid of patches, okay? And for audio, for example, uh, overlapping windows in time frequency, okay? So the idea is uh, that a patch in the output should depend by the corresponding, so a part in the output should depend on the corresponding part in the input. Or better, uh, this part in the output is independent from X given the associated part in the input. So this assumption is quite strong, but you see here that if you take uh, uh, the associated part, uh, so given uh, YP, the associated part in the input, uh, uh, quite large, essentially you are uh, containing all the information you need. So this is intralocality. Inter, uh, interlocality. Interlocality instead measures the correlation between patches in the input. And essentially, if the distance between two patches is large, I expect no cor essentially no correlation, while if they are very close, I expect a lot of correlation. Okay. <coughs> so now we are going to extend the, the previous analysis to take into account uh, the parts. And in particular, we consider losses that are um, a linear combination of losses over the patches. Okay, so um, essentially I'm not comparing two images, but I'm taking the images, I'm disgregating them in patches, and I'm comparing the patches. We obtain interesting results when the parts are uh, overlapping in a sense. Okay, so this definition could seem quite peculiar, but actually uh, if your loss function, so many, many, many losses can be written in this way. In particular, an interesting example is the humming loss or humming like loss. So if you have humming loss or for example, L2 distance squared, um, you can show that um, uh, it is possible to write them is a superposition of overlapping patches of the same size uh, distributed on a regular grid. So in a sense, given the, um, uh, the loss function, if, it, if the loss function is a humming-like loss, uh, you can impose the far structure that you like if it isn't regular enough. So you can consider it as a prior knowledge on the learning problem you are going to consider. Okay, then we perform the same analysis as before. We assume that the loss, uh, loss function on the patches can be written as an inner product, and we derive, the, as before, the uh, um, estimator F star and the corresponding uh, vector valued uh, conditional expectation mu star. Not here that mu star non, does not depend only on x, but on x and the corresponding part. It is interesting because when we are going to derive the estimator and then the algorithm, um, we are going to learn a function between uh, the uh, input space, the parts, to the uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So this is, uh, uh, I'm just going a bit fast, but um, Essentially, the idea is, is the same. So I have mu star, I perform the associated empirical risk minimization algorithm that I can solve, deriving the uh, 
the estimate or mu hat depending on x and p. So we can see some differences here. The matrix is not of dimension k, uh, uh, n by n, but is of dimension np times np, where p is the number of patches that you have. And the vector is of dimension n times p. Of course, you can optimize it in practice. Uh, there are many ways to, to compute uh, uh, kernel methods in a fast way, so to reduce this computation from n cube p cube to essentially uh, n log n p log n in specific context. Okay, this is the final estimator. So the construction is essentially as before, but the estimator shows some peculiarities. So here, um, the, the main difference is that we have another uh, some sign here over the, the, um, the patches. How can we interpret intuitively this function? So we can consider alpha i p prime xp as a delta function, approximate delta function. So a function that is uh, one, close to one, if the uh, p prime part of the uh, height uh, uh, input is similar to the p part of the uh, point x for which we want to do the prediction. So the algorithm is working this way. If the, um, so here I'm depicting a um, um, uh, segmentation problem. So here we have some uh, bikes. The idea is that uh, this uh, part of the wheel is very similar to this part of the wheel. So here as, as a segmentation, I would like to have the segmented part associated to the part which is similar to the input. And it is exactly what the algorithm is encoding. Why? Because here we are requir uh, requiring that if the uh, p part of the input is very similar to the p prime part of a training point, then I require that the uh, p part of the output to be similar to the p prime part of the um, observed point in the training set. Okay, in the same way, as, uh, as before, we derived uh, a um, comparison inequality. And from the comparison inequality, a uh, um, uh, consistency result and a result on the learning rate. The inter I just I'm just showing here the result on the learning rates. It is interesting since we have, um, so we have the exponent one fourth as before, we have n as before, but we have also other elements here in particular q, gamma, p, and the number of parts. So here the, the assumption is that we are using a kernel over the parts of the um, input that is uh, uh, um, universal. As before, we have interlocality. So the p part of the input is independent from x given the p part, the p part of the output is in conditionally independent from x given the p part in the input. And then we have a covariance between the parts that decays exponentially between the distance of the parts. Okay? So if gamma, that is uh, how fast the, um, the correlation go to zero, is, uh, is very high, we have that this, cos this, this quantity is essentially constant, non, non depending on the number of parts. And so the learning rate is one over NP to one fourth. So even in this case, if I have uh, image net with only one input image that contains all the images inside, I still have this, the correct rate. It is one over the, no the number of parts in the image. Vice versa, if the images are, um, the, pa the patches in the image are very highly correlated, then this quantity is in the order of p, the number of parts. And so you recover the standard rate of one over square uh, n to one fourth. Okay. This is, uh, what we have seen before. So uh, let me say it again. So 
if gamma is close to zero, so the patches are super highly correlated, or maybe I've chosen patches that are too large, I still have a rate in the end of minus one fourth. But if I have intralocality and the patches are not really correlated, so the correlation goes to zero quite fast, then I have a rate that is n times p to the minus one fourth. So essentially here you see the effect of having an inner structure in your uh, structure prediction problem. Obviously, the underlying assumption is that there is a structure and you were able to find it, but quite often it is natural. For example, in images you have patches, in audio you have uh, structure in terms of windows. In text, you have the, the grammatical structure, so um, a kind of tree-like structure, and so on. So, it is the last slide. We have seen uh, a, a unified algorithmic framework to deal with, prob uh, with a wide family of problems in structure prediction. You need just to know the input space, the output space, and the loss function. We have strong theoretical guarantees, similar to the one of empirical risk minimization. And in particular, we have a generalization that is able to leverage the local structure in the data. Of course, we have seen only uh, uh, some equations and uh, uh, few theorems. And what we are doing now with the colleagues in Willow at IRIA, we are starting a wide experimental validation in the problem of uh, of the blurring and uh, super resolution. Of course, it would be interesting to find uh, what happens uh, if we use uh, different estimators for the, for the um, uh, conditional expectation new star. And in particular, it would be interesting to study how to integrate uh, in a more general way this approach with uh, um, uh, different uh, estimators beyond non-parametric estimators like with the deep neural networks. That's it. So we have time for question to Alessandro. Don't be shy. Okay. Wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great uh, talk. Uh, Alessandro, I was wondering uh, um, if, um, so in the formulation, uh, a number of things have become linear, mm -hmm. but then in the end, the minimization with respect to Y at prediction time is, mm -hmm. is, uh, is potentially a difficult problem, right? I mean, like, so depending on Absolutely. the embedding that you have chosen, uh, solving the, the argument is, is potentially difficult. So um, are there <coughs> problems in which uh, this somehow can be uh, um, easier, and, and you know, um, can you comment on this and, and situations where uh, this minimization can be solved maybe more efficiently, or if the parameterization, parameterization can be uh, changed in order to simplify this? Okay, so it is a very good question, and now so maybe I can discuss on the, on the previous estimator that is easier. Okay, so if you see here, the optimization problem does not depend on the parameterization of the loss function, so it does not depend on h, uh, psi, and, uh, and phi, but only on the specific loss function that defines your problem. So, uh, in, many, in some cases it could be nice. For example, if y is a manifold and l is a, a convex, um, geodesically convex function over it, you can use, for example, uh, uh, gradient methods over manifolds, okay? If your, um, it is less interesting but if uh, Y is a, uh, is a convex subset of R to the D and then is convex, you can do the same. Of course, if uh, Y is the space of, the, of strings uh, and L is the edit distance, uh, I mean, it is known that the barycenter of uh, edit distances uh, over strings is, uh, is a very difficult problem, so. So you have studied optimal transport uh, distance. Absolutely. Which is a very good example. Indeed, we have, a, we have a, if, uh, if uh, Y is a simplex and L is vastest time, vastest time by the centers. Another question. So in your, in your theory, um, so you have a rate of uh, power one-fourth, mm -hmm. and I uh, would expect usually more like one-half. 
Is it uh, something that is possible to bridge or is it just uh, it is, um, really a fundamental limit? Uh? It is an interesting question indeed. Uh, um, for example, if we cast the regression problem in this setting that we could, we, we would like to uh, uh, obtain a rate that is n minus uh, one half. But since uh, uh, the only thing that changes here in the result is the constant and not the rate, for any, for any um, uh, structure prediction problem, in a sense, uh, uh, we are, we are uh, uh, doomed uh, to go as, as low as the slowest uh, uh, structure prediction problem. So it would be interesting to do a refined analysis that is different also in rates, uh, uh, depending on the specific uh, structure prediction problem. Okay. Any other questions? No question. Let's thank uh, Alessandro for his talk. Thank you.